We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the final session of day one at CNI. Uh, I'm Paige, I'm our communications coordinator. If I haven't met any of you, I would love to meet you tonight at the reception or tomorrow, please come find me. Uh, so now we are gonna conclude with our five minute lightning round sessions. I just ask that you please hold your applause um, or try to hold your applause between each session. Also, please hold your questions for tomorrow or tonight up on floor four for our reception, which immediately follows this. Uh, also, this session will be recorded, much like everything else here today, and will be posted online in the coming weeks following this meeting. And immediately following the five-minute lightning round sessions, my colleague Diane is going to come up, give a brief overview about our breakfast discussion tables, which will also take place on the fourth floor tomorrow. Um, and then we're going to have a few of those facilitators also introduce their breakfast topics. So there'll be a few more speakers following um, the five that we have up here. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Peter, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and um, thanks for coming. Uh, I had to dash off stage to get my reading glasses, so I'm um, reading off of um, notes written primarily by Nettie Lagasse of NISO, and I'm filling in for Mike Furlow, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, this, this CNI. So uh, thank you for tolerating my uh, read-along uh, primary mode of presentation here. Um, so this lightning talk will briefly describe elements of the NISO draft recommended practice on controlled digital lending, which is available for public comment through April 21st. Mark the date on your calendars, please. I'm a member of the working group. We hope you'll take a look at that document and provide your reactions to it. This project began at NISO in early 22, after many groups had already started discussions, experimentations, and implementations on CDL based on white papers by Michelle Wu, Kyle Courtney, Dave Hansen, and others. The intent of this work at NISO, partially supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, is to articulate gaps in system interconnectivity and to recommend how these needed connections might be made. If CDL is more broadly supported technically, it would be possible for more libraries to adopt it, whether or not they are large, well-funded academic institutions. If there is a better understanding of how elements of CDL can connect, vendors or libraries themselves could create products or services to fill the gaps. After the comment period closes next month, the working group will review and respond to the submissions and potentially make changes to the recommended practice before it is approved and published by NISO. We hope to release it in its final form in early June. Cross your fingers. <clears throat> so I expect that many of us are familiar with and well acquainted with the outlines of controlled digital lending, which has been in use in libraries for some years now. CDL, by definition, includes support for own-to-loan ratios and content protection. This NISO project did not address legal aspects of CDL, which are out of scope for the project. And the document encourages libraries to evaluate any implementation at a local level, consulting with your own legal counsel. There were a few publishers who participated in the early discussions of the working group and various of the committees, but as the talk moved to details of lending protocols and other library systems, often at a fairly low technical level, they dropped out for reasons of expertise and time. But we hope to have publishers responding to this document and have circulated announcements to publishing channels as well. CDL, <clears throat> sorry, allergies here in California. CDL is part of a family of digital lending capabilities, including digitally owned materials, licensed ebook materials, converted print to digital, free to read, and open educational resources. It's related to these other types, which are not examined specifically in the draft document, which focuses on CDL only. We do recognize that all of these mechanisms for lending need to interoperate harmoniously within the library's management systems, policies, and processes in order to provide a unified front-end interface and experience to the end user, who, of course, won't really care what type of digital product it is. 
the working group sorted types of controlled digital lending into four architectural models. Model one, standalone, and model two, which is a local integration with uh, content or catalog systems, represent the types that work within a single institution. Model three, consortial shared infrastructure, and model four, distri distributed or fully decentralized, represent how CDL can be managed across two or more libraries. Of course, complex complexity escalates the further along this path you get. The draft recommended practice describes each of these in much more detail and in a comparative fashion. It also includes technical considerations for each. For example, how inventory must be connected and what metadata needs to be shared. The RP also includes general challenges that focus on data formats and interoperability. For example, we describe scanning standards, file formats, and the metadata for discovery as well as authentication and authorization and the complexities of access controls across institutions. Most of these discussions took place with a particular focus on providing a seamless user experience. Next steps outside the scope of this work, but hopefully to be taken up by NISO and others, are to further study to help solve some of the most critical issues that we've identified and to improve communication between and with industry partners. This slide is a snapshot from one of our appendices. The working group used an environmental scan of the marketplace in its early discussions to sort out various qualities and capabilities, which led to the development of those four models. We hope all of the diagrams and the tables in the document will allow readers to better understand both existing and possible future offerings. This is the complete cast of characters who served on the working group. All of us on the working group look forward to receiving your comments and on, on the draft document before April 21st. <laughs> you can access it at the working group webpage and via the NISO homepage. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, everyone. So today I want to share um, a project we start this year at the Center and the Virginia Tech Libraries. So um, AI, um, John McKenzie in 1955, coined AI in computer science. It's almost like 60, 69 years old. And uh, AI changed a lot, especially last year. So AI is a tool, now it's commonly accessible to everybody. I, I teach AI algorithm to my students every week. And uh, it's not like, AI is not just like uh, algorithms. In the past, a lot of computer science researchers to working in the lab. Right now, just like I do on the weekend, I teach my kids how to use ChatGPT because it's everybody can use that. And uh, to use these tools, it's become like, you need to think about how do you work with these tools. It will help you. And uh, again, this is the tools. So you have your domain knowledge. And uh, with these tools, and uh, you will become more efficient and more productive. Right? As you can see, like, now everybody can be a sourcer, right? You have a tool, okay? And uh, if you know how to interact with these tools, right? Tell them what you want to do, okay? And uh, you will become more powerful, okay? But interact with, it with AI need techniques. For example, we hear a lot of transformer today, right? So if you simply ask just GPT or whatever, quite transformer, so you maybe he will get you this kind, or maybe a movie, right, transformer, right? <laughs> but actually, you want to ask transformer, right, which is built entire choir chat box we see today, right? It's very complex. And uh, so it needs skills. And also, you can see there are a lot of research, right? If you really expert on talk to these tools, you will get very good performance. 
and the another apply to a, a field. It apply to multiple field. And you can see on the left side, you can apply to a philosophy law and uh, a lot different law, a lot different. As long as you know how to talk with them, okay. So these two about this, so there are a lot of technique research, like there are a lot of pump engineering, and they tell you uh, how to um, talk to them. And uh, of course, like uh, little shot, few shot, channel of thought, and uh, maybe a rake. Rake is just another kind of uh, pump engineering, just with the source you have, right? And uh, before you answer the question to the users, you combine your back end with your own data, right? Supply with the user's prompt to these models, then they can generate the answer, which will narrow down like like ghost reference or something, right? And also, you can think about it. So our brain have two systems, okay? If you read the book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, they tell you our brain have two systems. One system one and then another system two, okay? System one just like quickly just answer. You, you like ask you like two parts, two is what? You just simply answer four very quickly, right? Most of our time just like just using system one. But human different with machines, we most of the time we create our value or creativity is using system two, okay? Just like I create these slides, I using most of my system two, okay? So this like, I do you know, okay? So back to here, right? If we can use some kind of this technique created by these companies, right? And we just using them, okay? And uh, using our logic, okay? So we can create things more efficiently, okay? And the call to our, come to, so this is also another research you can see. With this help, a lot of people use that, increase a lot of productivity and efficiency. This is from the Microsoft, okay? So which come to our project? So we, we start a prompt libraries. So sources need a spell book, right? So we need prompt recipes. And we want to create this project to share this recipe to everybody, okay? So it's a collect every useful prompt, efficient prompt, to interact with large language models in order to get the result we want, okay? And also we want to create, create this one and we can create a data set to fine tune this language model to for a uh, particular domain, something like that, okay? All right, so this is our center. So we, we start from this uh, prompt libraries and we also want to create some prompt education that in, in, in help users to how to use these tools more efficiently. And also break parties, okay? And uh, so library for the future, right? So think about other companies similarly it's just one example, right? They just up skills, okay? And uh, we can find uh, prompt engineering maybe is another kind we can help librarian to use this and uh, to do many different things, okay? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Prom, and I am the Associate Dean for Digital Strategies at the University of Illinois Library. My goal in this brief time is to describe a project that has deep significance to me personally in my evolution of my work related to digital preservation and to network building, and also to invite your participation and support in this project. It seeks to expand the range of institutions and people who are able to participate in and determine the content and shape of digital archives. And while I would like to emphasize that while I'm what one member of this team, um, the group that I'm working with is uh, really an entire group of people from Africa who uh, discussed their needs with me and um, brought forth the project idea that I'm presenting here and I'm very humbled to be presenting this on, on their behalf. So the project that I am seeking to describe um, seeks to support groups in Africa who are working already to digitally preserve and provide access to indigenous knowledge. This is knowledge that contributes to and that they see will foster both social good and the achievement of sustainable development goals. The project takes as its basis that this is really a matter of epistemic justice, both in whose stories we are preserving and also in the ways in, in the people who participate in shaping 
the systems that preserve and network indigenous knowledge. I'd like to emphasize that while the project is the result, it's, it's really the result both of some deliberate planning that took place and also a little bit fortuitous. Planned in that um, the African partners had been working with the Digital Preservation Coalition for many years, hoping to attend um, IPRES meetings and other uh, facilitate deeper engagement with digital preservation resources that had been developed in the global north. But also fortuitous in that a specific set of circumstances led to these five African partners coming to Urbana-Champaign last fall for the IPRES meeting when we were able to resolve visa issues and we were able to get funding from some of our academic partners to bring them. So we sponsored five individuals from a variety of African um, countries and the group after the meeting expressed a strong desire for a north-south partnership to develop so that the, both so that they can benefit from digital preservation resources and network resources that we have in the, in the north but also so that we could, and so that they could incorporate their own knowledge and expertise back into materials that had been developed in the North. So the vision that the partners um, described to me really complements other projects that are currently taking place, such as the Endangered Archives Program and the Modern Endangered Archives Program, as well as initiatives that CLEAR, for instance, has launched with their Hidden Collections in Africa initiative. What's really new here is that this project seeks to catalyze African leadership um, and to activate a network of people in Africa who are engaged in community-engaged research and links the pres digitization and preservation and networking of these resources specifically to the achievement of sustainable development goals. You can see here the initial partners. What happened here? I think I'm going the wrong direction. That was bad. Okay, so here you see one slide, and I think I'm gonna bring it forward here. So there's the group from IPRES 2023, and we have our partners here, so here you can see them listed. Um, and as a group, the teams listed here are um, seeking to do three things. First is to develop some, co-develop co some training materials. Second, to provide some train the trainer session in the use of those materials in Botswana in Ghana and in Kenya, and then third, to provide tangible support for community champions, indigenous knowledge holders, and African partners who wish to digitally preserve and provide access to indigenous knowledge, specifically on topics related to food production, ecosystem preservation, climate change mitigation strategies, peace building and reconciliation efforts. The project's ultimate aim is to facilitate long-term reciprocal partnerships. We do have a short-term grant from the University of Illinois Call to Action Program and to continue fostering community-engaged research. So there are the goals, and I think I'm a little bit behind on my slides, but I'd just like to say that work will commence with a summit that we're beginning uh, in September of 2024 at the IPRES meeting in Ghent, Belgium. So if you're interested in that and in this project, come to Ghent and speak with me there more about it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so today I will introduce an organic farming inspired library filing model and its implementation at Virginia Tech Libraries. Uh, the purpose of this founding model is to cultivate library transformation. So transforming the library's technology and service model is a complicated matter. Uh, for example, how can we move the library to be more embedded in campus research and learning and how to motivate our librarians to be more if proficient in using tools like AI and data sciences. If our staff have very little positive experience with this, the chances that they will move along with us is not very high. Learning the lessons from organic farming, we know that in order to have more sustainable yields, we must do two things. The first is to put more time, efforts, and resources to prepare the soil to till, to fertilize, and to water. And the second is to avoid introducing artificial stimulus to forcefully promote the growth. 
In other words, let the nature take its courses. So the four Chinese characters highlighted in the background painting's caption refers to a cautionary tale told by Mencius circa 300 BC about a man who was so anxious about the slow growth of his crop seedlings that he pulled them up. So uh, going to the first components of organic farming, how to prepare the soil, the water, and fertilizer for library growth. Like farming, library transformation needs a symbiotic local environment. In other words, we need our local faculty members and students to work very closely with the library. To incentivize campus partnership, Virginia Tech Libraries initiated a seed grant program to fund research collaboration between library staff and campus researchers through short-term projects that directly advance the researchers instead of the library's agenda. As a condition to receive the seed funding, the project must include at least one library staff and one campus researcher as co-PIs and equal partners. A proposed project must leverage library resources and or expertise. Now the second uh, component of organic farming, the not pulling your seedlings part, that translates to avoid peak winners and allow a thousand flowers to bloom on their own terms. That was the idea behind a program design that replaces the standard merit review with the scope review. In this case, a library admin, in this case that was me, worked with an established faculty member to turn the scope review into a mentoring process to help early career faculty members and the library staff to crystallize research ideas and scope them down into actionable items. The winners then are selected through a lottery. In two years, Virginia Tech libraries have invested $325,000 to found 48 projects involving 60 faculty members from all uh, Virginia Tech colleges and 32 unique library staff from all library departments. So what are this library staff's core competency that qualifies them to be equal partners in these projects? Not surprisingly, data science, AI, systematic review, and uh, makerspace expertise together represent about a third of these partnerships. Also blooming are our disciplinary expertise in 3D VR, bioinformatics, social sciences methods, especially running surveys, agriculture, and vet med, as well as uh, the uh, library's uh, forte, such as metadata, publishing, digitization, data management, and web development. We're also very delighted to see that newly developed strength in podcasting, hip hop, oral history, and research impact are also recognized by our faculty members. Um, many of these uh, skills are derived not only from the librarians' uh, education and training experience, but also their life experience and their social networks. So what about the outcome? First, this program is a major DEI win. Faculty members in assistant professor rank and women BIPOC faculty members are significantly more likely to be selected than their campus demographic compositions. The reason is not that we pick the winners, but that people from these groups are just more likely to apply for this grant. And in terms of research productivity, it's also very high. And remember, these are very short-term projects. And so far, within two years, one book, many peer review papers, and other forms of creative work, such as music, uh, uh, um, concert, and, and, and podcast, have been produced. Actually, the large portion of the deliverables of these projects are actual, actually external, proposal, uh, external funding proposals. Um, an innovative open education resources project recently won a publishing award, and then three of those uh, external founding proposals has been founded by uh, National Archive, NEH, and Mellon Foundation. So this, this founding makes the Sea Grant's return on investment reaches about 300%, make this pilot also a financial success. 
so in addition to Virginia Tech, three other ARA members' libraries are currently studying this model and will implement their local adaptation through a project called Joint Professional Development Institute, or Joint PDI. So if your library is also interested in knowing more or even participate, please get in touch. The project website is at jointpdi.github.io. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Um, my name is uh, John Dunn. I am Assistant Dean for Library Technologies at Indiana University Bloomington, but I am here today uh, as a member of the uh, Digital Preservation Coalition. And I am here to talk with you about a new program of work just launched by the Digital Preservation Coalition, or DPC, that will support existing and new members across the Americas, uh, bringing greater access to good practice and excellence within the dynamic digital preservation community across the region. Uh, but first, uh, digital preservation. So digital preservation, um, in the context of the DPC, is the series of managed activities required to ensure that digital materials are available in the format we need them, when we need them, for as long as required. This is quite a challenge, as uh, all of you know, and not something that any of us can do alone. Therefore, collaboration is a central pillar of a shared response to this shared global challenge. One cannot collaborate alone, and in the DPC, we work together. It takes a community, and all are welcome in the dynamic and diverse DPC community. Originally founded in 2002 uh, by its first members in the UK and Ireland, the DPC's membership has now grown to incorporate 157 members in 24 countries around the world, including 19 right now across the Americas. With staff already in the UK, Australia, and the Netherlands, the DPC works uh, with its network of organizations to deliver resilient, long-term access to digital content and services through community engagement, targeted advocacy work, training and workforce development activities, capacity building, and sharing of good practice and standards. Uh, and that is done through the ways that you see here uh, on this slide, as well as many more in addition. Oops. oops. Which brings us to the present day and the newly launched DPC Americas program of work. Uh, the DPC Americas program will see a new US-based DPC dedicated staff member working to support existing and new members across the Americas region. And I should note recruitment for this position is happening right now. Uh, the new DPC dedicated staff member will be given an organizational home by the New York City-based nonprofit profit Ithaca, a longtime DPC member organization. They will be employed by Ithaca and seconded full-time to deliver the DPC Americas program of work. This program will bring greater attention and access to good practice and excellence within the digital preservation community from across North, Central, and South America. By establishing a US-based resource, DPC hopes to expand its collaboration with the established robust digital preservation community that already exists in the Americas to complement, celebrate, and sustain their activities and amplify them for other DPC members around the world. And after a period of planning and development, uh, DPC will deliver a program of face-to-face -face events for members of the Americas, as well as facilitate knowledge exchange between organizations in the region through briefing days, working groups, and task forces. So Indiana University Libraries is a very new member of the DPC. We joined just last month uh, in February as an associate member. And really, the, the reasons for joining the DPC in our case uh, were twofold. One is this broad goal of helping to advance uh, the cause of digital preservation uh, to sustain access to research and cultural heritage for future generations, but also at a practical level so that we could better learn from and contribute to the broader uh, global digital preservation community. So uh, at IU, we have a very large amount of digital data under preservation uh, compared to many of our, our peer institutions in the US. We have about 20 petabytes of data under preservation, mainly created through digitization of video and or, uh, audio and moving image materials, but also all of the other sorts of formats that all of us are dealing with. And we really need to bring in that global perspective to help us figure out how to sustain digital our digital preservation activities and in exchange, help to be able to sh share some of our unique experience and learnings uh, in dealing with audiovisual resources and dealing with large-scale digital preservation uh, from our own context back with that broader community. 
So uh, Chris Prom, uh, who spoke just a little bit ago from University of Illinois, and I will be hosting a breakfast discussion table tomorrow morning from 7.45 to 9 a.m. If you'd like to find out more about joining uh, this inclusive digital uh, uh, global community of the DPC, um, or ask questions uh, about uh, the DPC's work. So just look for our table sign in the, uh, in the breakfast room, or you can email the DPC team directly using the contact details on this slide. Thank you very much.